Therefore, it is time for a question period. The member from the PN Park. Um, I just want to point out I wasn't in the House this morning, so there's no carryover for me at this particular point. <laughs> My question is for the Acting Premier. On May 2, 2017, a wise man once said, but the first way to address debt is to balance the budget. We're balancing this year and next year and the year after that, and we're lowering debt to GDP over the long term. Guess who said that, Speaker? The Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, what happened? Why is this government backtracking, breaking their promises? Are they really that desperate in the lead-up to this election? Well, Speaker, thank you very much, and uh, Speaker, I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, answer on behalf of the Minister of Finance because I know if he was here, he will say that we're really proud to balance the uh, budget this year. In fact, we will be bringing forward a budget that will show a surplus, uh, Speaker. Wow. Wow. Uh, that has happened, Speaker, uh, because of the hard work this government has done in, in, in making sure that we are spending our money wisely in important services like health care and education. Because, Speaker, our economy is, is growing, creating more jobs. It is one of the most uh, booming and, and hottest economy uh, in Canada and in, in, in North America. America, uh, a speaker. A uh, speaker. That Answer. is because Ontarians uh, are seeing uh, unprecedented uh, 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 employment uh, rates. Speaker, um, and Thank and we'll continue to build on that success. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. If he believes what he just said, I've got a gas plant in Mississauga to sell him. Another member across the aisle once said this: There was not an issue that resonated more with constituents than the foolish spending of their hard-earned money. I remember being at a door doorstep. It was a modest home. The people worked hard for what they had, and they asked me to remember them if I got elected and then governed. They said, please remember us. Please remember that you're spending our money, and you're spending our money. That was the former deputy premier and the architect of that Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, she didn't remember them, none of them remember them, and we now have, at minimum, an $8 billion deficit Question. to inherit. So when did they forget they were spending that family's money and every other Thank Ontarian's you. money? Minister of Economic Growth and Development. Minister of Economic Development. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Speaker. You know, it's an interesting question coming from the member uh, from uh, from Nepean. I uh, I think I think the most salient point in her question was the notion of how important it is for us to remember, Speaker. I think everybody in this legislature, and frankly, all 13 million people right across this province, clearly remember the kind of devastation that was leveled on health care and on education and uh, the, the havoc that was wreaked on municipal governments and their local decision-making autonomy, the fact that subway lines were literally killed and filled in, Speaker, the fact that significant public assets like the Highway 407 was, sold, was told and then sold and sold to a foreign consortium, Speaker. Everybody in this province has a very clear understanding and a very clear memory for exactly what it meant the last time reckless decisions were made by Conservatives when, unfortunately, Answer. they had power. Speaker, Our government is different. We do not believe in cutting. We believe in building. We believe in caring. And we believe in Thank supporting you. the people that we're proud to represent. Final supplementary. The member opposite the minister is bankrupting this province, and we want to talk about memories of the last 15 we years. We can talk about hallway health care. We can talk about uh, the oh, highest high rates in, in North America, the highest high rates, and, and we can talk about closing schools if that's where he wants to go. But I'm going to continue with the former deputy premier's words. She says it's just so outrageous to me that governments spend money on what are, in essence, political pieces. I'm proud to be part of a government that will address the situation. Let us remember that the taxes they are paying the money that we are taking from them to spend wisely for them and not for us. Wow, how times have changed over the last 15 years. They have forgotten who they are. They don't care about the people of Ontario anymore. They have, Mr. Speaker, clearly left us with at least an $8 billion deficit. Question. They are not spending the money wisely for the people. Isn't this spending just for your own political priorities and not for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, what a short memory they have on that side. Let's let's talk about how times have changed over just the last couple of months, Speaker. And it's so unclear to those of us on this side. In fact, Speaker, I would tell you it's unclear to the people of Ontario where do Ontario's Conservatives stand on really 
key issues. We know that over the last number of months they've talked about perhaps they would run a deficit, perhaps they would balance. Their, their newly minted leader, I think he took all of three minutes to reverse himself four times on the question of whether or not he would balance his book, Speaker. Just yesterday, the member who's asking this question was unclear about whether under their new platform heading into the election campaign, whether they'd continue to support investments in, for example, mental health, Speaker. We have no clue at this point in time what they balance, what they would invest in. But we do know, because past practice does indicate future behavior, Speaker, we know what Conservatives do when they get the chance. They cut, they cause havoc, they destroy lives, and they Answer. do not build, Speaker. We will not let that happen on our watch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Listening to the uh, the round, we're in warnings. Would the member like a warning? New question. The member from Nipi and Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is again to the acting premier, but I wanted just to address that uh, last point. Um, the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party built this province. The Ontario Liberal Party has broke this province. And under Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals, hydro rates have tripled. In fact, families pay a thousand more dollars per year than they did in 2003 when they took office. This government simply does not care about the people, and they certainly haven't been fair to the people of this province who are struggling between heating their home and eating food. There are still families that are making that difficult choice in this province. So, Mr. Speaker, is this the legacy the government of Ontario wants to leave, the fact that they are forcing people between heating and eating? Thank you. Well, uh, 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 Speaker, it's, it's quite a recollection of events that the party opposite had when they were in government because if they called shutting down schools all across the province as building province up, if they called shutting down hospitals. The member from Leeds Granville is warned, the member from Simcoe Gray is warned, the member from uh, Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. If they call shutting hospitals all across the province as building the 20. province up, if they call cutting welfare rates by 22% wow. uh, as building province up, uh, that's quite a legacy, Speaker. And then on top of that, they left a $5.6 billion wow. deficit, Speaker, on top of all that. So if that is their definition of building a, 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 a up, no, thank you. We do not want to go back there again. We have seen that movie before, and that need not to be. We need to build this province up. Thank you. Supplementary. You want to talk about a movie? This is a nightmare watching you guys with the tiller. I'm telling you something, Speaker. That's why 2,000 people showed up to see Doug Ford on, on Monday night, because they want fairness. And the Premier Wynne and the Liberals have accepted $1.3 million in donations from companies who received energy contracts. That meant these insiders resulted in families overpaying $9.2 billion on their hydro bills. Wow. Then, to make matters wow. worse, Wynne Liberals sold off Hydro One. It was a fire sale that rewarded their donors, insiders, and fat cat friends. And that's why this government cannot be trusted anymore to do anything that is right or fair for the people of Ontario. Doug Ford has said he will reduce hydro Question. rates even further. Why won't this government do what Doug Ford wants? Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic thanks, thanks very much, Speaker. It's adorable to watch the member across talk about Doug Ford <laughs> and the crowd, the crowd that showed up to see him. Speaker, I'm guessing, I'm guessing those individuals that showed up uh, fully expected, as they should, given that party's track record and their new leader's track record, that they were heading out for a night to watch a slasher flick, Speaker, because that's exactly <laughs> that is exactly what that party and that particular new leader. A leader, I would suggest, notwithstanding the bluster that we hear in that question, a leader that that party is just a little bit nervous about because we know fully that most on that side didn't support his leadership campaign, Speaker. And in particular, as our Minister of Energy mentioned just the other day, I think it's really important. Back on March the 5th, a leading member of Ontario's Conservative Caucus said what every single Ontarian fully understands with his, and I'm quoting here, Speaker, with his erratic and out of control behavior, I worried that if Doug Ford was to lead our party, 
he would lead us to certain defeat. Speaker, I will say that would be the member from Prince Edward Hastings. I will say as a proud Ontarian, if Doug Ford ever takes over the leadership of this province, we are doomed, Speaker. <laughs> Order. I'm uh, disappointed. We're heading down a path I don't that anyone wants to go down and anyone wants to hear. Final supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. I just want to address something. Would the minister call one of his male colleagues adorable, and does he think that's appropriate? And will he apologize to me? The government's own internal documents and the Auditor General have confirmed that if the Liberals are re-elected, Ontario's electricity rates will skyrocket to the highest that they have ever been. They can't be trusted. They don't care. They are too glib to continue governing this province. So, Mr. Speaker, the question is simple. Why doesn't this government support long lasting and real relief for hydro customers across Ontario, or are they still only concerned with trying to eke out an election win in less than 78 days? Chief Government Whip is uh, warned. Minister. Speaker, I would first say to the member asking the question, if I, if I, if I said anything that, uh, that was taken the wrong way or that was offensive, my apologies. It wasn't intended to be delivered that way, so I apologize for that. What I would say, what I would say Speaker, and I, and I want to echo what I did say in the House the other day about this, I think it's perfectly appropriate for leaders of political parties and for political parties to have very strong views about what they should do with the future of the province if they aspire to become the premier. But I think in 2018, there is a core responsibility that aspiring premiers have, and that responsibility is to have the courage of their convictions and to level with the people of Ontario. And I think it's clear. A member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington is warned. Carry on. Because I was saying, I think it's abundantly clear that, as we've seen so far, neither any member of Ontario's Conservative Caucus or their newly minted leader, Doug Ford, have the courage of their convictions to level with the people of Ontario and freely admit what kind of damage you would do, who you would hurt, who you would harm, and what public services you would eviscerate if you have the chance to form government. And I don't think it's too much to ask for you to have Answer. the courage and admit exactly what kind of damage you will do should you form, should you form power. Thank you very much. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New no question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. Mohamed Akbar is a 27-year-old Torontonian who is currently working on a three-month contract. He has no health care benefits, no dental plan at all. His wisdom teeth are bothering him, and he knows they need to come out, but he can't afford to pay out of pocket for the procedure. Dental care is one of the basics. Why hasn't the Premier or her Liberal government done anything in their 15 years in power to help people like Mohammed? Thank you. Acting for you. Uh, speaker, uh, thank the member for the question, and, and I want to say, Speaker, that our government recognizes that, that to ensure fairness and opportunity for all Ontarians, there is an important role for the government to play in supporting access to oral health care for vulnerable people. Speaker, that is why over the years we have been working hard to, uh, in strengthening uh, the Healthy Smiles uh, program, uh, Speaker. Excellent. That program has been, uh, has been expanded. That provides pre-preventative routine and emergency dental services for children and youth from low-income households uh, across the province. In fact, Speaker, this program is helping more than 470,000 kids access important dental services, and this number continues to grow. Speaker, we started with children and youth, as, as evidence suggests that oral health problems are more Answer. prevalent among low-income families and children being most vulnerable, but we know, Speaker, there's more to be done, and I look forward to Thank addressing you. that in the supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, again to the Acting Premier. Mohammed grew up in a low-income household. He started working young to help out his family and to save for school. When he was 18, he had an accident on a construction job. He broke one of his front teeth. Mohammed wasn't able to get his tooth repaired properly for eight years. Why has the Premier left people like Mohammed to struggle in pain with no dental care for so long? Thank you. Acting Premier. 
Uh, speaker, uh, as we uh, reaffirmed in the speech from the throne, our government will be making advancements to ensure that more people without a drug or dental benefits plan will have access to more affordable prescription drugs and dental care. Speaker, we recognize and we, can, we have heard those stories from people like Mohammed as, as well, that it's important that they have access to prescription medication and that they have access uh, to dental, good dental care. And that is why uh, we, uh, as, and we appreciate the ideas brought forward uh, by the, the, the third party, Answer. are looking at ways to make those type of programs available. That is why we've been working with the same uh, uh, advocates uh, in our community Thank to get you. ideas how best to do that. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, back to the Acting Premier. Mohammed says that he suffered terrible self-esteem problems as a result of his front tooth being damaged for so long. He says the NDP dental plan will mean a significant improvement in his health and well-being. The plan will ease his anxiety. Why has the Premier done nothing in her time in office to ensure that young people like Mohammed don't suffer lasting emotional and physical pain because they can't afford to go to a dentist? Thank you. Speaker, I, our government has been, has been focused in, in strengthening and building our health care system, making sure that it is available to, to people, that it is a publicly funded uh, 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 system that is available universally across uh, our province. And Speaker, that is why we have continued to invest in, in good primary health care so that more and more Ontarians uh, have access to a family doctor or nurse practitioner or, or to their local community health centres to get good he uh, health care. Speaker, that is why, Speaker, just like uh, uh, as I was announced today, we continue to invest in a hospital speaker uh, so that, uh, that there is good capacity and good care available uh, through our hospitals. That is why, Speaker, we are expanding OHIP Plus program, a program the first of its kind in North America that is making sure that children and, and, and youth till the age of 25 five have access to free medication and, and it will expand to include our seniors 65 uh, and above in age as well. These are important building blocks, Speaker. These are important investments to create a health care system yes, that is tr truly universal in nature. And this government, under the leadership of our Premier, has been working hard at accomplishing that. Good question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Premier. Jason Miller and Holly Lumley live in London West with their five-year-old daughter. Shortly after their daughter was born, Jason and Holly were in a serious car accident, leaving them unable to work. Their total family income is just over $2,000 a month, which makes them ineligible for ODSP. But their combined prescription drug costs are approximately $3,500 a month. This means they do not fill most of their prescriptions because they simply cannot afford to. Speaker, why does this Liberal government not care about the high cost of prescription drugs for families like Jason and Holly's? Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite uh, for the question because I think she's making the point exactly why our government has chosen to develop OF Plus. That is why, exactly, Speaker, that our Premier is absolutely has been a champion. Member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Carry on. Speaker, our, our Premier has been a champion on the, on the national front in urging. Uh, the federal government and all provinces and territories that we need truly a national farmer care program. But, Speaker, we just didn't want to stop there. We wanted to start on that work right here in our province. And, Speaker, on this side of the House, we are really proud to introduce OHIP Plus, a first of its kind program that provides free medications, no copayment, no deductible to, uh, to all our children and youth till the age of 25. That is 4,400 uh, prescription medication available free Answer. just by showing your OHIP card. Speaker, that is a first of its kind program, and we're expanding that program to include our seniors as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Not only are Jason and Holly going without the prescriptions they need, they are also also going without dental care. Since cleanings and checkups must be paid out of pocket, they don't go to the dentist. A couple of years ago, Jason required emergency dental care for infected canines. He had to wait in dire pain in the dental office waiting room while his family and friends scraped together the money so he could pay for his treatment. Speaker, why has this Liberal government done nothing 
for 15 years to enable families like Jason and Holly to afford the medications and the dental care they need. Speaker, uh, uh, as, as I, I was saying uh, earlier, our, our government is very much committed to making sure that people have the care they need. That is why, Speaker, our government under our previous leadership has been steadfastly focused on strengthening our health care system by making investments in our hospital, like the, the new announcement today of $822 wow. million dollars of new investment. That's a wow. four. 0.6% increase in, in base operating funding uh, for our hospitals to, to allow for more capacity all across the province. The in, uh, announcement speaker we recently made of investing $2.1 billion over four years in mental health and addiction. Wow. Speaker, I cannot uh, tell you what kind of impact that kind of well-integrated and coordinated care is going to make in the lives of young people and people and of sir? all age background in Ontario who are suffering from mental health or addiction challenges. These are all important steps in making sure that we have got a Thank strong you. universal medical health care system. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, almost 2.2 million Ontarians go without the medication they are prescribed by their doctor because they can't afford it. 4.5 million Ontarians go without dental care because they can't afford it. Jason and Holly are not alone in their struggle to pay for their family's basic medical and dental needs. Instead of trying to close the gaps in Ontario's health care system over the last 15 years, we've seen a Liberal government that has doubled down on Conservative style cuts and budget freezes, leaving families on their own. Speaker, after 15 years of inaction, does this Liberal government seriously think that Ontarians will believe the promises they are offering now, only 77 days before an election? Nope. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, we're just not making promises. We're actually delivering on these very important commitments, such as OA Plus, the Speaker, that came into effect uh, starting January the 1st, that covers free medication for all children uh, and youth till the age of 25. Uh, absolutely for free. It's, uh, it's a first of its kind uh, program speaker in Canada, in fact, in all of North America speaker. That is something all members of this House should be very proud of, uh, speaker. Unlike the new Democratic Party, which, puts, uh, which put forward a, a plan, speaker, that I think barely covers about 120 most popular medications. Uh, speaker, that's not sufficient. That is not universal whatsoever, uh, uh, Speaker. So, uh, Speaker, our program covers all 4,400 uh, medications that are on the list. Wow. And as we have said, Answer. we plan to expand that. Speaker, all these things are going to be in the budget, and we hope that the NDP will support such a progressive budget that is for the betterment of the people of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from the Speaker, P. Carlson. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Minister of Finance. Um, last May in 2017, you said, but the first way to address debt is to balance the books. We're balancing this year, next year, and the year after that. We're lowering debt to GDP over the long term. That promise didn't even last a year. Not only are you running an $8 billion at least deficit, you doubled down on Monday. And I want to know, because I think I've known the minister well enough to understand he would probably prefer to balance the books. So I want to know, what was his reaction when the premier forced him to run a deficit? Was he upset? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me remind the member opposite. We, in fact, have slayed the deficit, yes, we, have. we have balanced the budget, and now we have a surplus position. And the first step in managing debt is to balance the books as we have. Now, going forward, Mr. Speaker, there are some uncertainties. There's trade negotiations that are uncertain. There's degree of interest rate and other matters before us. We have a 2% growth year over year coming forward. Now, that's ahead of Canada, ahead of the G7, and Ontario's economy is strong. But it's that position of strength that enabling us to look at other opportunities to stimulate even further growth. Now, the member opposite may want to make those cuts. She may want to proceed to put people in harm's way in and our economic recovery. We choose different Mr. Speaker. We're investing in health care, we're investing in schools, we're investing in mental health, we're investing in the growth of our economy for the benefit of the people of Ontario.
If the minister is so Thank proud you. of having slayed the deficit, why is he going to run at least an $80 billion deficit in the lead-up to this campaign? They have tripled the debt under his watch. They have lost 330,000 manufacturing jobs. They have the highest hydro rates in North America, and they are boasting of an $8 billion to come deficit. I want to know, is the minister embarrassed to walk down Bay Street? And he, Would he like me to change his title from the Minister of Finance to the Minister of Debt? <laughs> the, member, the member knows that in this place we either refer the, to them as their title or their writing, and the member will withdraw. On speaker. Minister. Uh, speaker, let me remind the member again, the largest debt ever made in the history of Canada was under the Conservative government in the recent years. The largest deficit in history was $60 billion by the Conservative government. In the last 40 years, they have only balanced the books. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. In the last 40 years, they've only balanced the books four times, one of them which was bogus, Mr. Speaker. We have a balanced budget. We are in a surplus position. We're going forward to make choices, deliberate choices, to invest in our economy and, more importantly, balance the needs of the people of Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. There are four and a half million people in Ontario that do not have dental coverage. That's an astonishing number. What's more shocking is that every three minutes in Ontario, someone visits a doctor's office or emergency room for a dental problem. In Windsor, over 700 people visited the Windsor Regional Hospital's emergency department for dental issues last year. Wow. At a cost of at least $314 per visit to the emergency department, visiting the hospital for dental pain not only increases wait times and overcrowding, but it's a major financial burden as well, only for the patient to be told that they need to see a dentist. Windsor's downtown mission is building a half-million-dollar dental clinic, all from community donors, which will provide free services to address the overwhelming need. We know that dental care is good social policy, but it's good fiscal policy, too. In the last 15 years, why didn't this Liberal government tackle the issue of dental care in Ontario? Thank you. Acting yes. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you so much. And certainly on this side of the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, we agree that good dental care is most important uh, for Ontarians, and that's precisely why we have invested in this regard, uh, the expansion of the Healthy Smiles program. We alluded to several times in this House over this last week, and uh, we certainly know that having good oral health and a healthy smile can have positive impacts on a child's overall health, self-esteem and ability to learn. And so we are absolutely committed. It sounds like we're very much on the same page in this regard. And of course, those on social assistance, those most vulnerable also have access to uh, dental benefits. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm very pleased that apparently uh, the third party has come to see the light. I don't recall this in their platform uh, in 2014. I don't remember any comments in this regard. We've been working on this, Mr. Answer. Speaker, consistently for years and years. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the acting premier. What the minister may not know is I actually was a dental assistant that worked in an office where we actually helped the children who for through the Healthy Smiles program. It is chronically underfunded, and the wait list is years long. Stop the clock. Start the clock. There is somebody over there that is warned, and I would hope that they would not think that they could hide behind someone's head. Finish, please. Just like this Liberal government chose to ignore dental care for the past 15 years, they've devastated our health care system, too. Last month, David Williams of Bell River had a heart attack in Florida. After two weeks of being told there were no beds back home in Ontario, he was forced to have bypass surgery in the U.S. 
When he returned home, he received a medical bill for almost $900,000. Wow. The reality is that while some hospitals in Ontario are overcrowded and patients are forced into hallways and bathrooms, there are other hospitals with empty beds going unused because there is no government funding. In Windsor, we know Hotel Du Grace in Windsor has 89 Question. unused mental health beds alone due to lack of funding. Will the acting premier admit this government has neglected the health and wellness of the people of this province for 15 Thank you. years? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm having a little difficulty relating this supplementary to the original question. However, uh, we will continue to talk about what we have done with our health care system. We have a world-class yes, health care system. Yes, Earlier today, I was with the Premier announcing what we are going to be doing in this budget in relation to hospital uh, capacity issues. And so we will be investing, in fact, $822 million this year. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that the audience in that auditorium at North York General, made up of some of our healthcare professionals and also family members and patients, oh, were Lord. most appreciative. They understand that we're looking at the needs of the people of Ontario and we continue to build our healthcare system. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Earlier this year, I was proud to stand with the Minister of my riding in Barrie as this government released a stronger apprenticeship system for Ontario, the province's strategy to develop a system that provides end-to-end -end supports for apprentices and employers and responds to the needs of the changing economy and workforce. Speaker, I was very pleased to see that five out of 12 of the apprentices were women. In a rapidly changing global economy, Ontario must build a highly skilled, inclusive workforce to keep our competitive edge. Speaker, the people of Ontario have always been our strength. Ontario's apprentices deserve a system that opens opportunities, connects them to good jobs, and helps them gain the skills needed to be successful in their career. Can the minister inform the House of the great work that this government is doing through the apprenticeship strategy to help all Ontarios, Ontarians adapt to change question. and achieve their goals. Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education and thank Skills you, Development. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you so much to the great member from Barrie for this question. I had the pleasure of uh, doing my first announcement in this ministry with her in Barrie. Speaker, as Ontario's economy continues to grow, this government is always thinking ahead by developing programs that keep us on the forefront of of growth here in Ontario and meeting the needs of our people. And that is why, Speaker, we've launched Ontario's Apprenticeship Strategy, a vision that we share with our apprenticeship partners and the many people looking to learn new skills and start an exciting career in the trades. I want to say thank you to my predecessor for all her work on this file. Incredible. Speaker, our vision for the future is an apprenticeship system that is easy to access, navigate and, compete, and complete. It's a future where apprenticeship Answer. is valued and recognized as part of our post-secondary education system, working in the trades puts people on a path towards stable, good-paying and you. meaningful careers. Sorry, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I'm thrilled about the work that is being done to strengthen the province's apprenticeship programs. I think it will make a real impact on people's lives. I know that Ontario's apprenticeship strategy was developed following extensive engagement with partners in the apprenticeship system from all across this province, and the strategy directly responds to what our ministry heard from over a thousand people. We know that the province needs more people doing work in the skilled trades, which means we need more people completing these apprenticeships. Would the minister provide the House with an update on what the province has done to increase the number of people looking to work in the skilled trades and what we're doing to support them to complete their training? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you again to the wonderful member from Barrie. So our apprenticeship strategy focuses on five key areas of action that will help more people start and finish an apprenticeship. We want more people to be able to benefit from the rewarding career that they can find in the trades. And in fact, we have grown apprenticeship registrations from 17,000 in 2003 to more than 24,000 in 2017. But we knew that there is more work to do. So one thing we're doing is introducing a new apprenticeship spa, grad, graduated apprenticeship grant for employers or GAGE to offer financial incentives to businesses, not just when they take on an apprenticeship, but all the way through key 
key milestones to completion of their training. We're going to increase access for underrepresented groups, offering additional financial incentives for employers who take on apprenticeships from groups such as skilled um, uh, women, Indigenous people, newcomers, and people from diverse backgrounds. Answer. The modernization of the apprenticeship program is about ensuring that seamless pathways and the right supports are offered to apprenticeship employers and Thank training you. delivery agents. Question. The member from Halliburton, Fourth Lake Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Status of Women. Well, what a day it's been for women in politics. We have the Minister of Economic Development and Growth, called my female colleague adorable, in a demeaning and condescending manner. Order. <clears throat> Please finish. The Minister of Finance called the women behind him at an announcement today eye candy. What is going on over there? How is this acceptable? It's not. Thank you. Minister of Status of Women. No, no sorry. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker. Take it easy. Take it easy. A member from Nepean Carlton is warned. <clears throat> Somebody's got a W already. Minister. Speaker, this morning we had the pleasure of being hosted uh, by, the tr by the hospital and together with men and women of all ages were standing there and we thank them for their tremendous uh, contribution to their service to uh, the hospital, to, the, men, to, to the, the, the individuals they care for in our society. We express that gratitude. I thank them, and they are all ages um, uh, of all different cultures, both men and women, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite is insinuating something which is distasteful because it's the men and women that we were, uh, we were congratulating, and we will stand with them always, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, uh, Minister, you did say eye candy, and its condescending attitude like that of your male ministers is shocking and appalling, and quite frankly, it's unacceptable. Here, here. So how can this government claim to support women when they use such demeaning language towards them? So will the minister apologize for the words that he did use this morning? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You say it, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to apologize to the beautiful people that work so hard for this, for this province and our country. They're doing hard work. They deserve to be congratulated, and that was what I was doing. And I, and I take offense, Mr. Speaker, that the member opposite is insinuating something that I have held so dear. And that's equality, respect that's right. for all ages, for all genders, including my wife and my two girls. And at that event was also me thanking my niece, Nicole Pacheco, who does tremendous work at that hospital. I take full offense. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. 
Your question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the acting premier. Speaker, in Oshawa, there are more people waiting for long-term care beds than there are existing beds, and that's why my constituents, Mary Ann Follist and Stephen Hoare, came to my office in a state of hopelessness. Their mother, Anna, was sent to the hospital by her retirement home in early February, a home that could no longer meet her needs. After she received emergency hospital care, there was nowhere to send her. Anna is in limbo, waiting in the ALC, or alternate level of care unit in the hospital. Her family has no idea when or if she will be able to leave. There is nowhere for her to go. This government has allowed long-term care waitlists to balloon to a crisis state. When will this government take responsibility for the long-term care crisis and start helping families like Anna's get the care that they deserve? Thank you. Uh, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. And of course, we have been addressing uh, the issue that the member opposite is uh, referencing. In fact, uh, uh, just recently, we have announced the opening of 5,000 new long-term care beds over the next four years, as well as providing more than 15 million more hours of nursing, personal support, and therapeutic care annually for residents in long-term care homes. This is part of our 10-year plan. You know, Mr. Speaker, we are really into long-term planning. <clears throat> this is a stark contrast, obviously, to the third party. We've never heard of any plan on their part to increase long-term care beds. So our 10-year plan is to create more than 30,000 new beds over the next decade, and we're continuing to work with the long-term care sector to determine exactly where those beds should be placed in our province. Thank Great. you, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. This government has had 15 years to help seniors and families get the care they deserve, and instead of a long-term care plan, they have a long-term storage solution. And if they truly cared, they would have already fixed the wait list. Instead, they have only made them worse. Liberal cuts in privatization, much like what we would see from Doug Ford and the Conservatives, have left Anna's family in an impossible situation. Her family is being told that if they want to get Anna into appropriate care before the end of the year, they would have to start looking far outside their community. While she has been in the hospital, Anna has fallen, she's gone without any showers, and she's watched her hospital roommate and other forgotten seniors die while waiting for a space in long-term care. Anna's family is terrified. Speaker, that she is also going to die in the hospital waiting in ALC, which is serving as long-term storage, not long-term care. How does this government justify years of gutting our health care system while families have nowhere to turn Question. and seniors like Anna have nowhere to go? <clears throat> well, Mr. Speaker, um, the member opposite uh, perhaps just needs to be reminded of our throne speech earlier this week, wherein we talked about all the investments our government has made over the course of our being in government over the last 15 years, specifically for the uh, vulnerable population that uh, uh, she is. Finish, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, long-term care homes are part of the picture. But our investments through the years in home care have been absolutely uh, phenomenal, in my view. Since 2013, our government has increased funding for home and community care to help those frail elderly stay where they would wish to stay for as long as possible in their own homes by some $250 million per year. So this is in addition to the government's ongoing funding of more than five billion dollars wow, wow. of course our thank you thank you Mr. speaker your question the member from Carleton, mississippi mills speaker my question is to the minister of finance minister today i will introduce a private member's bill that will amend the insurance act to allow life insurance policy owners to use their life insurance policy as collateral to obtain a loan this will give life insurance policy owners the freedom to use their life insurance policy the same as any other property they might own, property such as land, buildings, stocks, or bonds. All these properties can be used as collateral to obtain a loan. This is a fundamental right of a property owner. It is a right denied. 
Minister, will you help us restore this property right to life insurance policy owners? Will you support our bill to amend the Insurance Act? Question. Thank you. Minister of Finance. And thank you to the member for the question. I know uh, um, the member for Eglinton Lawrence also put forward a, mem a private member's bill to the same effect. Uh, for those that don't know, this is a we're talking about the sale of existing policies to third policy and third parties. Um, it's something that has been prohibited in uh, in Ontario since the 1930s. Quebec has it now, and they're actually looking at uh, retracting from it. Saskatchewan is looking at prohibiting it. So that only leaves two or three provinces now. Uh, who are still allowing it to take place. It's a financial instrument. We need to foster ways to protect consumers and investors. We've done so much more now to provide for those who are near death or are looking at providing for more supports in their elder years. That's why we take the steps that we have most recently Answer. coming in the budget. But we will look at this uh, opportunity and we'll address it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Seniors Affairs. Minister, this bill will help. Regrettably, it has to be directed to the same minister. They have an option to move it to someone else. So ask the question, please. To the Minister of Finance, to the Minister of Seniors Affairs. I stand corrected. Minister, this bill will help seniors. It will allow seniors to borrow against their life insurance policy. Many seniors are struggling to make ends meet because of the high cost of hydro bills and cuts to senior services. This access to their wealth, to their cash, will help seniors to live without worry and without having to impose on their families and without having to depend on government. They will be able to live with dignity. It is time to give our seniors the freedom to use their wealth the way they want. Minister, will you help us to help seniors? Will you support our bill to amend the Insurance Act? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Senior Affairs. Minister of Senior Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite for this question. And, uh, you know, as the Minister of Finance outlined, this is a good idea. It certainly has some merit in helping people who want to access assets, being able to access those assets. But also, we're concerned about consumer protection because the risk is that some vulnerable people might get caught in fraud or be forced to uh, sell at a lower price. So we really need to balance the innovation uh, with consumer protection. So I look forward to the introduction of this bill, which was uh, introduced earlier last year by the member from Eglinton Lawrence, and I spoke to it. So I really look forward to debating this bill. But, but I do want to assure the member opposite that we're not cutting services to seniors. If anything, we are enhancing services to seniors. Perhaps we missed the announcement last week, uh, earlier this week, where we said we are expanding OHIP Plus to all people over the age of 65. Answer, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. New question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Today is World Water Day, a day that recognizes the importance of protecting the most vital resources. In Ontario, we're lucky. Our province touches four of the five Great Lakes, and in my riding of Northumberland Quinty West, seven of the eight municipalities border the shores of Lake Ontario, the majority of them relying on this resource for their drinking water. We know that protecting this precious natural resource is an essential part of helping Ontario families and communities thrive, and we can do it alone, Speaker. That's why the province is investing $1.5 million in grants to pro for projects that allow communities to, pro to participate in protecting and restoring Great Lakes through the Great Lakes Guardian Community Fund. So that this fund, we're enabling greater communities' participation in protecting the local watershed. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House Question. how the Great Lake Guardian Community Fund encourages Ontario to protect and restore this important natural resource? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. 
Well, thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, for uh, that very important question as we celebrate World Water Day today. And I would start off by toasting you with a glass of tasty Toronto water, Speaker. I'm delighted to take this opportunity to talk about the importance of protecting water here in Ontario. We know that it is a valuable resource, Speaker, and that's why we're helping communities take action to protect their local watershed. Speaker, uh, since 2007, Ontario has invested more than $170 million into 1,420 local Great Lake protection projects that have reduced harmful pollutants, restored some of the most contaminated areas, engaged hundreds of partners and community groups to protect and restore the health of the Great Lakes. This improves, Speaker, one project that I'm particularly fond of, the Girls Can Too program in Caledon that empowers girls to learn about environmental and skill trade sector. Through these programs, Speaker, we're helping Ontarians take action in their communities, Answer. promote efforts to clean and protect the Great Lakes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. Speaker, we know how important it is to keep our environment healthy and safe for Ontarians. That's why we're investing in protecting our Great Lakes. Speaker, through the Great Lakes uh, Guardian Fund, over 37,000 volunteers have planted more than 285,000 trees and shrubs, released over 800,000 fish, built and enhanced 760 trails, and collected more than 200. 2,800 bags of garbage. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House how this government is, is further strengthening our water protection in this province? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd be uh, delighted to. And I thank the uh, member from uh, Northumberland, Quinty West, again for that important question. You know, um, the government has taken significant actions to increase uh, water protection for the health of Ontarians and for the overall environment. Uh, a few of the things we're doing, Speaker, we've updated standards to further protect our, our drinking water. We've taking, uh, we're taking action to reduce uh, algae blooms in Lake Erie. Uh, we're introducing and have introduced stricter requirements for bottled water permits, and we're strengthening water testing uh, requirements in schools, Speaker. Uh, our government takes our job to protect the environment very seriously, uh, Speaker, but what is shocking to me is that the PCs have walked walked away entirely from any credible plan to protect the environment. You know, just yesterday, Speaker, the member for Nepean Carlton, she The member from Chatham Ken Essex is warned. Carry on. The member from Nepean Carlton couldn't answer a single question yesterday, Speaker, about how they would protect the answer. environment if they were elected. Meanwhile, we've taken serious steps to protect both the water and the Thank overall you. environment, Speaker. New question, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I think the minister will agree that we must plan for Ontario's future health care needs. Part of this planning must ensure the adequate training of our future health care delivery professionals. Mr. Speaker, there seems to be a bottleneck in the system, leaving many of our valuable medical school graduates unable to practice medicine. The problem stems from our medical school students not being able to match with the required residency program. Unlike the days when the minister attended medical school and I myself went to optometry training, all medical graduates must now complete a residency program to receive a license to practice. Will the minister agree that more should be done to ensure we fund medical students, many of whom are here today and all female, I may add, who are able to treat patients? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health, Health and Care. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to recognize those medical students who are with us uh, today. I think if I had attended when I was a medical student, perhaps I would never have engaged in this particular uh, profession as a politician, uh, because question period, as they have seen, is, a, is an interesting place. Um, and so I know that the private mem uh, the member opposite has introduced, I believe, a private member's bill or a motion in this regard. And 
and it is an important question. And I certainly look forward to hearing uh, the results of the debate later today. So we do know that the number of unmatched Ontario medical graduates has been increasing in recent years, and that we recognize the challenges faced by those medical graduates who do not obtain a residency position through the matching Answer. process. So we do take this ver issue very seriously. We're reviewing the outcomes of the matching process, and wor we're working Thank with you. relevant stakeholders. Thank you. Great Thank, you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister. Our medical students are very concerned about graduating and not finding residency programs. In fact, the students of the Ontario Medical Student Association are here today to raise their concerns. According to AMSA, the greatest issue that they want government to address is unmatched medical school graduates and physician services planning. These medical students want to become doctors. They want to work at our hospitals and clinics. They want to collect patient data for research yep. into new cures and treatments. Unfortunately, some of our brightest and hardest working young adults are not getting a fair chance. Mr. Speaker, the number of unmatched students is rising in part because this Liberal government reduced the number of residency program spots. Later today, I will be introducing a private member's bill to address the issue. Will the minister show her support for our future generation of physicians by committing to support the Careers in Medicine Advisory Committee Act? Thank you, Minister. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'll certainly commit to working with our medical schools to support Ontario medical school graduates through the upcoming 2018 matching process and to develop effective, sustainable solutions to this issue. I would like to point out that the uh, matching process is, in fact, Canada-wide. <clears throat> and so it is important to note that this is actually a pan-Canadian process. It's a process where Ontario medical graduates compete with the graduates from other Medi Canadian medical schools. So we're going to be working with our provincial and national counterparts to better understand this issue, and we will certainly do everything we can to ensure that every one of our medical students finds a place to practice Great. in the future. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. My constituent, Amanda, told us that she grew up without basic dental care because her parents didn't have dental plan at work. They couldn't afford to pay for appointments to the dentist. Because of that, Amanda knows firsthand what a disadvantage it is to not have access to a dental plan. Amanda is 28 years old. She can't work. She has lost most of her teeth and has reoccurring infections and debilitating pain. And now she has been told that she needs to have all her remaining teeth extracted and obtain dentures. Why does this Premier and this government choose to prioritize selling off hydro instead of investing in a dental plan that would help Amanda and other Ontario families. Thank you. Acting Premier. Uh, speaker, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Spe <coughs> speaker. And uh, I'd just like to remind the House that we did reaffirm in the throne speech that our government will be making investments to ensure more people without a drug or a dental benefits plan will have access to more affordable prescription drugs and dental care. Obviously, I think we're all waiting with anticipation to see exactly what that means in our budget. What I do know is that we have been consistent in an, our ongoing investment in the health care of Ontarians since we took office 15 years ago. In particular, Yet again, I would like to talk about our Healthy Smiles program. This is a free, preventive, routine, and emergency dental services for children and youth from low-income households across the province. In reference to the question uh, posed by the member opposite, uh, the case that she refers to sounds like she might qualify for dental benefits through our social assistance program. Thank, Thank you. you Speaker, because Amanda is now receiving social assistance, she has been advised that the standard emergency care for adults is four extractions every six months. At this rate, it will still be more than a year before Amanda is out of pain and able to look for a job. Speaker, the NDP has a plan to help every Ontarian, from children to seniors, to access dental benefits either through work or a health care card. 
No one should have to deal with the pain or lifelong damage of going without dental care. Can this Liberal government explain to Amanda why they think it's fair to pay the CEO of Hydro One an executive salary of $4.5 million while they do nothing to help families like hers over the past 15 years? Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we do recognize that there are adults and seniors <clears throat> that struggle with uh, access to affordable dental care. And that's why, of course, we do have existing publicly funded programs such as the Ontario Disability Support Program and benefits through Ontario Works that may provide coverage for those in need. And so we did create, back in 2015, two working groups with the Ontario Dental Association to discuss this particular issue. On this side of the House, of course, we want to consult, we want to listen, we want to get the best advice. And so we, we uh, as a result of those uh, working groups, uh, we continue to want to look forward to them as we anticipate our budget to ensure that uh, the appropriate uh, care reaches those who need it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The question, member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. The human life sciences sector continues to be a priority sector for the Government of Ontario. With 1,900 sciences firms, our government and our people have worked hard to make Ontario the largest life science jurisdiction in Canada. And as a matter of fact, Speaker, prior to entering politics, I had the opportunity to work uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so I know firsthand that each day, our life sciences sector is working towards discovering new therapies and cures for various diseases. Our government has a strong track record when it comes to investing in this sector, Mr. Speaker, and we are committed to maintaining our global position. So can the minister please inform the members of the House how your ministry plans on further contributing to Ontario's successful life sciences sector? Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Davenport for that very good question. Mr. Speaker, last month in February, I was pleased to announce that our government is investing up to $50 million in a new life sciences venture capital fund initiative. This will assist life sciences firms leverage additional capital, helping them access the resources they need to grow their businesses and compete globally. These firms, Mr. Speaker, will foster new discoveries and technologies for treatments of, and the cure for illnesses and diseases such as cancer, multiple sclerosis, and diabetes. Uh, this all done, Mr. Speaker, while we are supporting high-quality jobs for people across our province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our government is always discovering new ways to support our people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for that answer. And this new venture capital fund will surely help Ontario retain its position among the 10 top venture capitals in North America. And it's important that we continue to invest in this sector so that we continue to discover new therapies and cures for various diseases. And the, men and the minister spoke about diabetes, which was discovered right here in Ontario, in the city of Toronto. Moreover, it will help create high-value jobs in a sector that already does so much to drive Ontario's economy. I understand that in recent activities, our government and your ministry has supported the sector through the establishment of the Office of the Chief Health Innovation Strategist and the Life Sciences Working Group. So, Minister, could you inform the members of the House how our investments have contributed to Question. Ontario's health care system and economy? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's life sciences sector generates $47 billion in revenue every year and with $9 billion in export and employing over 60,000 people, good jobs in our province of Ontario. We support life sciences sector, Mr. Speaker, in this province, and we want to see the sector continues to grow and flourish. Yeah. Uh, this is why we established the Office of Chief Health Innovation mm -hmm. Strategies as it works to support the, the medical technologies and enhance Ontario's healthcare system. We have also established the Life Sciences Working Group, Mr. Speaker, which identifies barriers to this sector's progress and the potential solutions. Mr. Speaker, this will position our province of Ontario as the destination for global investments and talents in every sector of economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Thank you.
The member from Bruce Green on sound on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Dr. Sai Eber. I notice he's in the uh, visitors' gallery and just want to say welcome to Queen's Park, Sai. Thank you. The member from Windsor to come see on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker, very much. I'd like to welcome some late arriving residents from my riding, actually former next door neighbours. Uh, Steve Sammons is here and his wife Beth. They're here to help. Liberal aide Megan Salmon celebrate a birthday today. So, welcome, Steve. Welcome back to Queen's Park, and happy happy birthday, Megan. Thank you, Deputy House Leader. Uh, uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, and Megan Salmon uh, works uh, in my office uh, in the government house leader's role. So, I also want to welcome Steve Salmon and Beth Nicosi uh, as we celebrate Megan's birthday today. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Double duty. I hope that's what I'm asking. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.